Hey guys, welcome to All Electronics. In this video, we are experimenting with a very powerful feature of the QSpy simulator. I wrote an article about a second order digital filter explaining how to design the filter using pole placement. QSpy allows to create a schematic block that runs C++ code. For testing this feature, we are going to implement the digital filter of the article inside QSpy using a C++ block. This video is a step-by-step -step guide to how to configure QSpy and create a C++ block and we are going to understand how we interface this C++ block with the rest of the electronic simulation. This is real engineering because you're watching our electronics. Before we start implementing this together, let me show what we have here. We have the QSpice and we have a block. This block here actually is running C++ code and you see that the block has inputs and outputs and here we see the input in green, just a square wave and the output here you see that is a second order system and it is a sampled system. Look at this. We see the source code clicking with the right button here, C++ interface, open C++ code. So this is the code that implements a second order discrete transfer function that has this behavior here. This is the article I commented. I recommend you to read this because here I explain in details how this architecture works and which filter is this one and how to calculate the direct form one coefficients, A0, A1 and B0. You see that this is a very simple architecture. We have the input here, two delay units and the output here on the right. And this is exactly what is implemented on this C code. You can see that the input here of the block becomes a variable. The output is also a variable actually a reference to a variable because we need to modify it. And for this case, as you're simulating a discrete system, we have also the clock that becomes an input here. And the implementation here is exactly the architecture we see here. Can you see how this is very powerful? We are running arbitrary C++ code inside an electronic simulator. You can see that I excited the input here of the block with a voltage source. So for each time step of simulation, the voltage here of this voltage source is presented on the in variable here. This happens with the clock also and everything that we assimilate to out becomes a voltage signal on the output of the block. And I just connected here a resistor so we can measure over this line here. I show you the clock here. Let's add a window and you can get the clock and you see that the filter is updated for each for each positive edge of the clock here. Look how nice this is. Here at the end of the article, I give a very interesting application of a low pass digital filter that is for control applications where we have derivative action like in PID controllers. Any derivative action is very noisy. As engineers say, a derivator is a noise amplifier because it has an increased gain with frequency. So when we implement PID controllers, usually we need to filter the output of the derivative. So we apply the derivative action just over the band of interest, reducing the amount of noise on the output. I explained this a little better on the article. You see here the difference of a pure derivative in orange and the green trace is a much cleaner derivative. You see that the phase is leading, so we have the predictive action of the derivative, but the signal is much cleaner. So just to show you the flexibility that we have by being able to combine code with the electronic simulator. In this example here, we have the low pass derivator that I explained there on the article. In out two, we have a pure first difference derivator. And in parallel, we are running an analog derivator using a resistive capacitive network, an RC network generating output tree. And we can simulate both. Look at this. This is very nice. And we see here, guys, we have in red the test signal, is a sinusoidal auto signal. And you see that it's noisy because we added here a random noise source in series with the input. V2 here is the sign, V3 is the noise source. And looking here at the output tree where we have the RC derivator, we see that the output is leading. Okay, we have the phase lead, but the output is very noisy. Look how the noise was amplified in some sense. The signal noise ratio was reduced because you see that the amplitude of the signal is smaller. So the signal to noise ratio at the output of the derivator is decreased. And you can see exactly the same thing happening here for the discrete filter that is implemented on the code in this gray block. I changed the color so it's easier to see. You see the green output is the pure discrete derivative, very noisy. 
And you can see the low pass derivator as shown on the article with a much cleaner output. Look at that. And of course, as this is a discrete system, we have here a discrete output also. You see? It's interesting to see also that as the derivator with the low pass filter, when combined, create a band pass response, what happens is that, of course, the phase lead is not exactly 90 degrees. But this usually is not a problem when compared to the benefits of having a much greater signal to noise ratio. Because any phase lead is useful for creating the predictive action on a controller. We don't need to have exactly 90 degrees. Now that you saw the capabilities that QSpice is bringing to the simulation game, we are going to see how exactly we create a C++ block, how we configure the ports, how we compile the code and run the simulation that has electronic components and the C++ code running all together. So now let's do it together so you can see how to proper configure QSpice creating a C++ block in your simulation. Let's go. We are going to first create a new project, a schematic. It created here a new window, so I will close everything that I have here. Let's start really from scratch. First thing is to save this project here. And now we can start. We can click with the right button and select draw hierarchical entry or we can press Ctrl H. So let's try Ctrl H and let's draw here a gray box. Digital video is the name I used for saving the file here. We can change the name of the block like my, my first block and we can add the input and output ports. So let's add a port here. This will be the input. We double click and add the name here in add port, out, and we are going to add here our clock input, and we also need to add a ground. You can be thinking what the ground is doing here for the code, but the ground is defining the reference level where the values of the input and output variables are calculated. So we need to have a reference. So one volt inside the code, a one signal inside the code is relative to the circuit voltage presented at the ground. By clicking G, we place a ground, we place a wire. By clicking R, we place resistor, G for a ground, and the wire we can connect directly like this. Ask for escape, double click here, 100K, easy. Let's add the clock source and an input signal. We can click V for adding a voltage source, add a ground here. By double clicking here, we can add the expression that defines this voltage source. So this will be a pulse voltage source. And that's very nice because you can just follow here the auto completion, right? You have the indication here of the arguments. This will be a square pulse from zero to one volts, zero delay, rise 10 nanoseconds, fall 10 nanoseconds. And I want the clock here to be one kilohertz. So we can define the T on as half the period, right? And the total period as the period of the waveform. Very, very easy. Let's add an input signal here, V for voltage source, pulse voltage source from zero to 10 volts, 10 and a second, 10 and a second. And this will be a very slow actually signal. Let's see 50 milliseconds and 150 milliseconds of duration. By clicking on the expression, you see you can move. By clicking space, you focus everything. And now we need to change this for actually being a C++ block. With the right button over the gray box, we go to show symbol properties and you need to change the symbol type to a DLL, clicking here. Now we are saying to QSpice that this block here should load a DLL, and iterate the simulation and also iterate the code of this DLL. And what's nice, as you're going to see, is that QSpice allows you to generate a template so it's much easier to start your block because it auto-generates all the boilerplate to access the variables and to create a Windows DLL. It also has a C++ compiler so you don't need to be messing with compiling things, you're going to see. After we define that this is a DLL, we need to create the bindings of the ports, the symbol ports, to the code. So we need to express here what kind of port each one is and which representation will be used on the C++ code. So clicking with the right button over one of the ports, we change the port type here to input and we are going to define this port with data type as a double. The output will be an output, also will be a double. The ground we define as the DLL GND and the clock we are going to use here 
a boolean. So that's very fascinating. QSpice will be translating the voltage. And when we define here that this will be a boolean, QSpice will generate a true false value on a C++ boolean based on the voltage. By default, the threshold is 0.5 volts. You can see this on the documentation. You see that we can add an expression to change some of the configurations of the block. The logic threshold for inputs declared as boolean, that's exactly the description, is 0.5 volts. So anything above 0.5 volts will be considered a boolean true. Any voltage below that will be considered a boolean false. And you see also that we can change the impedance of the port. Any signal that we output from the code becomes a voltage and this voltage has an impedance when it interfaces with the electronic simulation. And also we could define an output capacitance. Very interesting. Okay, I will save my project and now we can create the template. So we go right click here, C++ interface, create C++ template. I think your checkbox will be checked. So uncheck your checkboxes and click OK. And look at this. This is the created template for the block. This is all the boilerplate needed to compile a DLL that interfaces with QSpice. You see that we redefine an union with all the types here, all the possible types. Windows require that the DLL main return one here to inform that the DLL was loaded correctly. And the method that will be called from QSpice is this method here my first block, you see? Because this is the name that we added here on the block. So after the DLL is loaded, QSpice will be calling into this symbol here that has the same name and was exported by the DLL generated by this code here. And that's very interesting because the data just comes here on a vector of these unions here. You see that the template also adds here handlers for all the variables, all the ports we define. Very, very nice. Let's try to compile this. Compile DLL and run. I think it compiled. We can see by going into the folder. Yeah, you can see that we have here my first block .dll. It was compiled and the file, the CPP file is also available here on the folder. So actually you can edit the C++ file using any editor that you like. The only annoying thing is that QSpice will not be automatically recompiling every time the DLL. You, so you still need to open the dialog here, clicking with the right button and going to compile here inside this dialog here. Would be very nice if they add here preference to automatically compile every time. I think, yeah, I think they don't have anything like that here. Yes, that would be a very nice improvement. You see that the simulation of course failed because we didn't add here the command for the simulation, for setting up the simulation. So let's click T to add a directive and you can write dot run and let's simulate for 500 milliseconds. Now we can open the dialog here, compile the 11 run, run, and we can plot the input here. We see, we see the clock also running, right? The clock is here and probably no output because we didn't add any code. So we see zero volts on the output. Now let's implement the filter of the article inside the C++ block. Let's go. Here's the diagram for a reference. Let's go, guys. I don't like big lines, so I will break it here. First thing is that we need to have a clock edge detector because this is a sampled system and we need to clock and we need to execute the logic by the clock input that we added here. So let's first implement a positive edge detector. We can do that by having a clock state variable. And we can create a fence here. So if the input clock is false or there is no change between the input and the last clock, we go to the end. Ha, ah, go to. If you're hearing people saying that you should not be using go to's, there are very specific situations where go to's are the best statement that you can use. And this is one of the cases you're going to see. And here in the end, we just need to get the new state of the clock. This should be an equal echo. As I'm doing this with you here in real time, I will be doing mistakes. Look how clean this is guys, because now we have here a protected part of the code that will run just if the clock changes. And look how clean this logic is. You see, now we can add our code here and the code that we add here in the middle will be running at the clock frequency that we are generating here by this pulse voltage source. If the clock is positive and we had a change on the clock state, the execution will pass through here and execute the filter code. So for implementing this filter here, we should have here um, the two delay units, right? 
And guys, uh, let's just add the A0 and A1 terms here for this test. Let's say that we add here negative 0 0.23 and here static double A1 equals 0 0.7. The article goes in detail about how to calculate the coefficients of the filter. As this is not the idea of this video here, we're going to just iterate over some values here to see this working on the simulation. But here on the article, I explain exactly how to position the poles on the S plane and also in the Z plane to create the filter response you want with the resonance frequency and the Q factor you desire. And now we just follow with the implementation, right? The output will be the input, a minus the z1 delay times the a0. I should be calling this z0 and z1, right? Be better to understand, I think. Yeah, more or less because z1 means delayed by one, right? Yeah, let's go back. z1 times a0 minus z2 times a1. Yeah, that's, that's the filter. And now we just shift here. z2 becomes z1, right? We need to shift the output to the delay units. This is a direct form one architecture. Let's see if this works, guys. I think that it should work. Let's see if we have a over zero. Compile the LN and run. Ha! <laughs> it just worked it. Ha <laughs> For the first time, guys. Look at this. So let's organize this and we can have our code. I reduced the code a little bit. Look at this. Look at the second order response. Control G will enable the grid. Look at that, guys. Right click to get options. Zoom to fit. We can also add a new window and add the input here. Look at these guys, that's so nice. Let's add them in the same plot actually. Can you see how powerful this is? I know that this is just an example that's a bit silly because we are running a discrete filter on an electronic simulator that tries to simulate continuous time domain ele electronics. But can you see how powerful this is? I got very, very excited when I saw the opportunities that this creates because we can create any arbitrary codes, very complex state machines. We can we, we can simulate anything and interface this with the electronic simulator around it. I didn't explore this too much yet, but I think that even for digital filters, this can be useful. One little tip here is that we can create net names, right? Because now like the outputs name it net 01 and the input here is named net 03. You press N and we call this input. And again, you can write output. These are net names that exist here on the diagram level, right? On the schematic level. This will not be changing the name of the ports that are related with the code, okay? So we are not changing the names of the ports. We are just naming the signals, the wires, right? So it's easier to see uh, when we plot the graphs. So I will close this and let's simulate again. Now, if we measure, you see voltage input and voltage output. And guys, you can have here the code on your side and you can iterate in your code. Let's change here the code. Right click, compile and run. We changed the filter a little bit. Let's see what can we do here. I'm just throwing here our arbitrary values. Yeah, we changed the response. Yeah, that's very, very nice. I got very excited when I saw this happening. Look at this. You see that we could add here a new input that would change the future in real time. I think I have an example doing that. Let me open it here. Yeah, you see this one that actually what we are doing here is that we are changing the future. We have a voltage source here that becomes a parameter of the future. And you see that the future response changes. I did this just for fun to show you. Look at this. Let's see the source code here. You see that we have another input here that changes the parameters of the filter in real time and it changes the response. Very, very nice. And my challenge for you is to read the article and to implement the low pass derivative. To actually calculate the frequencies correctly here, place the poles and try to bring this to your code you can place the calculations here. This is a C++ code, so you can include the mathematics library for C++. You can do that. And guys, please leave your comments about what you'd like to see me simulating here on QSpice. I really, really want to explore these capabilities here, trying to create a much more complex simulation that is useful for the channel. It can be RF, it can be something non-linear. I'm also thinking that it should be possible if you can compile the DLL externally, we could add a hardware in the loop. If we could take the signal from the computer using a USB port or a serial port and creating some lock mechanism here to lock the data throughput with the step of the simulation, I think we should be able 
to add hardware in the loop for simulations with QSpice. This would be very, very amazing. So leave your comment here. I will send this video to QSpice just to see if they would like to support more videos here on the channel. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to the channel, give it a thumbs up and leave a comment about future ideas for us to simulate using QSpice and this very powerful technique of embedding C++ code inside the electronic simulation. I see you in the next video of All Electronics.